والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا قال رضي الله عنه ونفعنا بعلومه في الدارين أمين So Qadi Ayad, he says, may we benefit from his knowledge in this world and the next. I mean, we are in section two, part one, chapter one, section two. Allah, Allah is describing him as a witness and the praise and honor entailed by that. So this section, and I believe the next couple sections, we're still basically in the tafsir of certain verses of how they address and relate to the Prophet So he begins by saying, Allah Ta'ala says, O Prophet, we have sent you as a witness and a bringer of good news and a warner and a caller to Allah by his permission and a light giving lamp. Ya ayuha nabiyu inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira wa da'ayan ilallahi bi'idnihi wa sirajan munira. A light giving lamp. So all of the references to light in the Quran can be and are interpreted as references to the Prophet ﷺ, as we said last class. In this verse, Allah Ta'ala endows his prophet with all the ranks of nobility and every praiseworthy quality. He made him a witness over his community by the fact that he has conveyed the message to them. That is one of his special qualities. He is a bringer of good news to the people who obey him, a warner to the people who rebel against him. He calls to the oneness of Allah and to the worship of him, and he is a light-giving lamp by which people are guided to the truth. Ata ibn Yasar said, I met Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, radiallahu anhu and said describe the messenger of Allah to me he replied certainly by Allah some of the characteristics by which he is described in the Quran can also be found in the Torah it says O prophet we have sent you as a witness a bringer of good news and a warner of refuge for the unlettered you are my slave <clears throat> my messenger I have called you the one on whom re people reply one who is neither coarse nor vulgar and who neither shouts in the markets nor repays evil with evil, but rather pardons and forgives. Allah will not take him back to himself until the crooked community has been straightened out by him. And they say there is no God but Allah. Through him, blind eyes, deaf ears, and covered hearts will open. Something similar is repeated from Abdullah ibn Salam and Kaab al Ahbar. So, of course, the uh, you know Jews and Christians today will, of course not agree with our reading of these verses in their scripture as references uh, to the Prophet ﷺ. But at the time uh, of the, uh, the Salaf, there were Sahaba, of course, that were Jews that became Muslim, and they were Christian and became Muslim, so they knew these languages. And Kaab, the generation after that, he was, uh, you know, I, I mean, for all intents and purposes, basically a rabbi converted to Islam. So these people understood the scripture. So from our point of view, this is an accurate, this is how if we read those verses in its ancient language, that's what we would say. And that's something that is, is familiar. And we, and we mean no offense uh, by that. Uh, we mean no offense to anybody. It is what it is. One path of transmission from Ibn Has Ishaq uh, has, who does not shout in the markets, nor use a be obscene language, nor indecent words. I open him to every excellent quality, and I give him every noble trait. I make tranquility his garment, devotion his motto, fear of Allah his conscience, wisdom his understanding, truthfulness and loyalty his nature, pardon and correct behavior his character, justice his behavior, the truth his sharia, guidance is his leader, Islam his religion, and Ahmed is his name, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will guide him after misguidance, meaning from the jahiliyyah to Islam, and I will teach him after ignorance. I will elevate him after obscurity. I will make his name known after non-recognition. These were not known people in Middle Arabia. Middle Arabia wasn't even on the map as far as the Romans were concerned. They didn't even care about it. I will give him much after scarcity. I will enrich him after poverty. I will gather him after separation. I will bring together separated hearts and scattered passions and separate communities and separate communities through him. I will make his community the best community that has come forth to people. In another hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about the way he was described in the Torah. My slave Ahmed, the chosen, born in Mecca, will immigrate to Medina. Or he said Taiba, so one of the uh, names of Medina is Taba or Tayyiba. Uh, his community will be those who praise him in every state. So usually in the other scriptures, the Prophet ﷺ is referred to as Ahmed, 
as is mentioned on the tongue of Christ and others in the Quran. That's also in the Quran. And of course, the Prophet has many names. So it's not just Muhammad, but many names. And inshallah, I hope we get to that section. Allah Ta'ala says, those who follow the messenger, the unlettered Prophet, unlettered, by the way, when in reference to the Prophet is not a criticism. But if we were unlettered, it would be a criticism. So the Prophet ﷺ was meant to be unlettered on purpose so that when he receives the Qur'an, no one will accuse him that he made it up. That's the idea behind it. But unlettered doesn't mean ignorant because the Prophet ﷺ was the most intelligent of people. Sayyid Hussein Nasr used to tell us that as, uh, as Mary uh, gave the virgin birth of Christ ﷺ, so similar is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Prophet Muhammad of being unlettered. I always like that example. Uh, those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written down with them in the Torah and the gospel. And of course, there are some ulama of the East that found these references in the Upanishads and some of the Vedas, commanding them to do right and forbidding them to do wrong, making good things lawful for them and bad things unlawful for them. That's the Sunni creed. Our creed as Sunnis is we believe that which is halal, that which uh, the good is, def ah, I mumbled that up, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us is halal is intrinsically good. And what Allah ta'ala tells us is bad or haram is intrinsically bad. In other words, it's not defined through reason alone. Sometimes we rationally understand why some things are good and halal and haram, but not always. So the difference between the people of Sunnah and other sects is this is one of those issues. Actually, in some of the beginning of the khutbah, uh, historically, the, the khatib would say, you know, or something of that formula to indicate his Sunniness. I just rely on wearing a red cap. Um, making good things lawful for them and bad things unlawful for them, Re uh, releasing them from the heavy loads and the chains which were around them, those who believe in him and honor him and help him and follow the light that has been sent down with him. Again, the light, uh, they are the successful. This is from the Quran 7, 157. Allah Ta'ala also says, it is a mercy from Allah that you were gentle with them. You incline towards them. So the Prophet ﷺ was a philanthropist by the meaning of the word. He loved people and he inclined towards people. If you had been rough or hard of heart, they would have scattered from around you. But how many of us are refugees from the, the imams that yell and the, the imams that spit a fire and brimstone, right? Allah says in the Quran, if you were like that, no one would have followed you, right? But the Prophet ﷺ was gentle and kind. And that's how, and he was very gentle to women. خيركم خيركم لأهلي وأنا خيركم لأهلي. The best of you are those who are kind to their women and I am the best of you and the kindest to our women. If you had been rough or hard of heart, they would have scattered from around you. So pardon them and ask forgiveness for them and consult with them in the affair. Then when you have reached a firm decision, put your trust in Allah. Allah loves those who put their trust in him. As Samar Qandi said, Allah Ta'ala is reminding them that he made his messenger Sasam merciful to the believers, compassionate and lenient. If he had been harsh and severe in speech, they would have left him. However, Allah Ta'ala made him magnanimous, easygoing, cheerful, kind, and gentle. Ad Dahaq said something similar to this. As a matter of fact, our teachers always tell us when it comes to women, you have to pamper them. Pamper the women. And my sheikh all the time, he gives women flowers. If he, he, he likes to smell. He has a garden, so he likes to smell flowers. And he'll give women flowers. And he, he would tell us, when it comes to women, you have to be extra gentle and extra easy. I mean, not to cross the line of halal and haram, of course, but that is our obligation towards them because this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Allah Ta'ala says, thus we made you a middlemost nation so that you would be a witness against people and so that the messenger would be a witness against you. Abu Hassan al-Qabisi said in this verse, Allah makes clear the excellence of our prophet and the excellence of his community. Allah Ta'ala says in another verse, in this, in this the messenger is a witness against you and you are a witness against people. 
He also says, how will it be when we bring a witness from every community and bring you to witness against those? When Allah talks about the middlemost nation, he means balanced and good. The meaning of the verse is as we guided you, so we choose you and preferred you by making you an excellent balanced community to allow you to be a witness on behalf of the prophets against their communities. The messenger will witness for you the truthfulness. To understand the middleness of Islam, you have to know the other religions. If you judge Islam by the dominant culture, then we're going to seem antiquated because we pray five times a day, we fast Ramadan. But if you look at other religions and the extremities placed either to the left or to the right, you will see that Islam is very balanced, that has the right combination of you know, the law and spirituality and belief and practicality and pragmatism, so on and so forth. Uh, where did I go? It is said that Allah asked the prophets, have you conveyed it? They will reply, yes. So one of our beliefs is all of the prophets have conveyed their message. We don't accuse any prophet of not conveying their message. Then their communities will say, why do we believe that? Because of what's coming. Then the communities will say, neither any bringer of good news nor any warner came to us. So Yom Al-Qiyamah, they're going to be like, where? We didn't, we didn't hear. We didn't, no one said anything. Then the community of Muhammad will testify on behalf of the prophets and the prophet will vouch for them. My teachers used to say, Yom Al-Qiyamah, we're going to see some crazy stuff. It is also said that this verse means you are an argument against anyone who oppresses you and the messenger is an argument against you or a witness. Allah Ta'ala says, give good news to those who believe that they are on a sure footing with their Lord. Qatada Hassan al-Basri, Zayd ibn Aslam said, the sure footing is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who intercedes for them. Hassan al-Basri also said, it is their being given the Prophet. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, it is the intercession of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the sure intercessor with their Lord. As Sahl al-Tussari said, it is the preordained mercy which Allah placed in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad ibn Ali At-Tirmidhi said, he is the imam of the truthful and the true, the accepted intercessor, the answer ask, the answered asker. Muhammad, may Allah be pleased with him, as Sulami related from him. So, وَبَشِرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنَّ لَهُمْ قَدَمَ صِدْقٍ عِنْدِ رَبِّهِمْ قَدَمَ صِدْقٍ A firm footing. All of these salaf are saying that firm footing is Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he will intercede on not just our behalf, but on behalf of all of humanity, as is narrated in Bukhari. All of the people will go to all of their prophets, you know, those flags, they'll find their flag on that day, and they'll ask their prophets to intercede to make the hour and the judgment start, and all of the prophets will defer to somebody else until it is deferred to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he says, Ana laha, you know, this is for me, and he will intercede and he will prostrate in front of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, etc., as is narrated in the hadith. Okay, section three concerning Allah's kindness and gentleness to him. Included in this are the words of Allah Allah, pardon you. Why did you excuse them until it was clear to you which of them were telling the truth and until you knew the liars? Because Allah Ta'ala, this was a little complicated, I think, with the translation. Allah begins the verse, Afa Allahu Ank. Allah pardons the Prophet ﷺ first and then gives him this. Now, we're going to find in this section, one of the things, I think it's a section, one of the things that happens is he will critique some of the understandings that people have of some of these verses. And as I've, you've heard me say over and over again, there is, there is no mistake that the Prophet ﷺ made. So some people will look at this verse and see, oh, Allah Ta'ala is critiquing the Prophet. You know, it's like a form of itab. He's, he's telling you shouldn't have done like, yeah, ayyuhal, uh, no, uh, abasa wa tawalla. It's a very, that's the, the co most common example. That many, most, if you talk to average Muslim, what does that verse mean? You say, oh, Allah is, is chastising the Prophet ﷺ. But that's incorrect. That's an incorrect tafsir. So we'll get into that. Well, not that verse, but you'll see why it's an incorrect tafsir. Awun ibn Abdullah commented on this verse. Allah informs the Prophet how he has pardoned him before he tells him about his mistake. As Samarqandi related that one of the people of knowledge said that this means Allah has protected you and you are sound of heart. Why did you then excuse them? If the Prophet had first been addressed with these words, why did you excuse them? His, his heart would have burst out of terror 
at those words. However, Allah Ta'ala informed him first of pardon by his mercy so that the Prophet's heart would remain calm and only then said to him, why did you excuse them before it was clear to you who was telling the truth in his excuse and who was lying? This shows his high station with Allah, which is not hidden from anyone with the least intelligence. It shows the honor in which he holds the Prophet and his kindness to him. And if the whole of it were to be known, the heart would burst. Niftaway said, some people think that the Prophet was rebuked by this verse. Far from it. In fact, he was preferred by it. It's the exact opposite meaning. When he excused them, Allah Ta'ala informed him that if he had not excused them, they would in any case have remained sitting because of their hypocrisy. So no objection can be made to his having excused them. And this is the role of the ulama, is to correct these common misconceptions. Because unfortunately, even in tafsir literature, you'll find these type of tafsir. Because what happens is, Many people, you know, we are a, a, a tradition of narration. So it's very common when somebody sits to write, they'll just bring everything before them. And, you know, sometimes that's how things kind of get passed down. Like the Abbas Tawalla thing. Any Muslim who strives with himself and holds fast to the Sharia and his character must take on the adab of the Quran, the etiquette of the Quran in his words, actions, pursuits, and conversation. This is the basis of true knowledge and the arena of correct behavior, both as far as the deen and this world are concerned. This extraordinary kindness should be taken into consideration when asking from the Lord of the Lords, the one who blesses, blesses all, the one who has no need for anything, the benefits this verse contains should be taken to heart. The fact that Allah Ta'ala begins with honor before censure and takes pleasure in granting pardon before mentioning the error, if indeed there was any error. Allah Ta'ala says, if we had not made you firm, you would have leaned towards them the tiniest bit. You know the story of the, the Prophet's heart being cut open, so the chest being cut open and his heart being washed. And then the angels took out a black spot and they said, mink. This is the portion of Satan in you. And they cast it aside and returned his heart, uh, returned his heart into his chest. And he was sown. As a matter of fact, the Sahaba who described the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they saw the scar of that surgery in his chest, on his chest. So this was something physical. Now, many of the ulama talk about what that means. Does this mean that like us, there was, shaitan was whispering to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The ulama of this ilk, they say, no, it, it means something else. It means that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so merciful that he would have even had mercy for the kuffar, for the disbelievers, for Quraysh. So in order for him to be balanced in his approach, in his outwardly earthly role as a leader of a state, the head of an army, etc., that had to be removed so that he could deal justly with them, which is a completely different meaning than what we would commonly understand. And this is supported by this verse, uh, if, we had made you, if we had not made you firm, i.e. balanced, you would have leaned towards them the tiniest bit. One of the mutakallimun, the mutakallimun are the theologians. One of the theologians said, ilmul kalam is one of the names for the science of theology. It's, in, it's also called usul al-deen, tawheed, aqidah has interchangeable names. But usually in the literature, we call them mutakallimun because they like to talk a lot. One of the theologians said, Allah chided the other prophets after their slips he chided our prophet before anything occurred so that the chiding uh, would be more effective and a greater indication of love. This shows the greatest possible concern. Observe how Allah Ta'ala begins by talking of his firmness, firmness and security before he mentions what he wants to rebuke him for, fearing that his prophet might mix, fix on that. His innocence was maintained during the rebuke. The warning in no way jeopardizes his security and honor. The same applies to the words of Allah, quote, we know what we know that what they say distresses you. It is not that they are calling you a liar. The wrongdoers are just refuting Allah's signs. Okay, because there's another recitation that he's going to mention. The Prophet was never accused of being a liar. That would have been problematic if he was known to lie or not to be honest then how can they believe anything that he says? Ali said, Imam Ali said that Abu Jahl told the Prophet 
We do not call you a liar. Look, this is Abu Jahl himself. We do not call you a liar. We say that what you have brought is a lie. That's why he's Abu Jahl. It is also related that the Prophet ﷺ was distressed when his people denied him. I mean, who wouldn't be distressed? So Jibreel came to him and said, why are you distressed? He replied, my people have called me a liar. Jibreel said, they know that you are telling the truth. Then Allah Ta'ala sent down this verse. So when you look at what the Quraysh are actually saying, when Abu Sufyan, before he became Muslim, was with Heraclius, uh, the, the, the Roman emperor, he said, do you accuse him of lying? He said, no. Because even Abu Sufyan, before he became Muslim, the, the concept of lying was such a big deal. Like, of course, we don't, we don't lie. I'm the head of my people. How could you accuse me of lying? Look how, how easy people lie now. Subhanallah. Even the, the head of Quraysh, he thought that he was offended that he would be accused of lying. And he denied that they, they would accuse the Prophet of lying. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The verse aims in a gentle way to console the Prophet والسلام, and speak kindly to him, affirming that he is considered a truthful man amongst his people and that they are not denying him personally. They admit that he is truthful in both word and belief. Before he became a prophet, they called him the trustworthy. Al -amin, al -amin. His grief at being branded a liar was removed by this affirmation. Then Allah Ta'ala censures his people by calling them deniers and evildoers. He says the wrongdoers are just refuting Allah's signs. Allah removes, removes any disgrace from his prophet and then brands his people with pig-headedness when they epitomize wrongdoing by denying his signs. Denial can only come from someone who knows something and then denies it. As, and that's the essence of disbelief. Disbelief is that you know something and then you cover it and you reject it. Not that you don't know. If you don't know, you don't know. You're ignorant. And, and that's one of the problems that Muslim, some Muslims... It's everyone is a kafir. Like that's like the default, right? The default is every people are people, in sin. Not not the the kafir is like you have to make effort to become a kafir. It's like when they used to tell us in school you have to make an effort to fail to get like an F. Getting an F is an achievement because that's like an art. That means like you have to do something to get an F. Even if you write your name and just put C C C C, you get like a D or something. But an F, that that's like fen. That's like an art. So the kufr is the same way. I mean, in the, in the wrong direction. You have to make the effort to be a disbeliever. Of course, not that I'm advocating that, but I'm just saying, you see that he's saying that they understand and then they deny. Uh, Allah Ta'ala says, and they refuted them wrongly, and they refuted them wrongly and, and haughtily in spite of their own certainty about them. Then Allah consoles him and makes him rejoice by what he says about those before the promise of his help to come when he continues by saying, Messenger, before you were also denied, but they were steadfast in the face of the denial and injury, and they suffered, suffered until our help arrived. Amongst the things that are mentioned about the special qualities and Allah's kindness to the Prophet ﷺ is that Allah addresses him, addresses, sorry, all of the other prophets directly by their names. So Allah says, Ya Adam. Ya Nuh, Ya Ibrahim, Ya Musa, Ya Dawood, Ya Isa, Ya Zakariya, Ya Yahya. Whereas he only addresses the Prophet as Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabi, etc. Ya Muzam, Ayuhal, Ya Ayuhal Muzammil, Ya Ayuhal Muddathir, etc. Those are all names of the Prophet or attributes given for the Prophet. Section 4 concerning Allah's swearing by his immense worth. Allah Ta'ala says, by your life. Allah swears by the Prophet's life himself. Allah only swears by something that's important or big. You know, uh, uh, you know, Allah swears by those big creations of his. So here, Allah swears by the life of the Prophet. By your life, they are wandering about in their drunkenness. The commentators agree that this is an oath from Allah sworn on the length of the Prophet's life. It means by your continuing, Ya Muhammad, mean continuing to live. It is also said that it means by your life and also by your living. This indicates the greatness and respect and extreme honor. Ibn Abbas said Allah did not create, originate, or make any soul that he honored more than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I have not heard that Allah made an oath by the life of any other person. 
Abu al-Jawza said, Allah did not make an oath by the life of anyone except Muhammad because he is the noblest of his creation. Allah Ta'ala says, Yaseen wal Quran al-Hakim. Yaseen by the wise Quran. The commentators disagree about the meaning of Yaseen, saying different things about it. Abu Muhammad Makki related that the Prophet said, I have 10 names with my Lord. He mentioned Taha and Yaseen as two of the names. That narration, okay, is a very weak narration. And uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, one of the two pillars of uh, Salafi Wahhabi thought, uh, he critiques this narration and he says, La asla. There's no, it's, it's not even true. This guy in the chain of transmission is a wadda. He's a, a forger of hadith. This other guy is a weak guy. And he was you know, very upset by this narration. And because of that, and I just make a highlight, because of that, you find a lot of these Salafi people will criticize when we refer to Yasin and Taha as the Prophet's name. Okay? And what difference does it make? I mean, if it's weak or it's not weak, this is the, we are biased. We love the Prophet Sallallahu So when I hear the word Yasin, I'm going to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When I hear the word Taha, I'm going to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's very common with the Salafis in Egypt, especially. I don't know why they have a problem with this. Like I told you last time, there is something about this extreme Muslim mentality and the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. Look now at real knowledge. Look at how Qadi Ayah, he knows this narration is weak, but he still uses it. Look at the other things that he's going to say specifically about the name Yasin and Taha. My uncle's name is Taha. And my grandparents, Allah have mercy on them, named him that after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Abdurrahman al-Sulami, who is from the Salaf. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, one of the 12 Imams. Our Imams. We need to reclaim our Imams with our love for our Shia brother and sister said that the meaning of Yasin is, O Master, addressing the Prophet. I mean, if Jafar al-Sadiq said that, that's enough for me. If a Sulami said that, that's enough for us. Ibn Abbas said that Yasin means, O man, meaning Ya Insan. That is Muhammad. He also said that it is an oath and one of the names of Allah. As Zajjaj said that it means, O Muhammad. It is said that it means, O man or O human. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya, also from Al Al Bayt, السلام, said that Yasin means O Muhammad. Ka'ab said that Yasin is an oath by which Allah Ta'ala swore a thousand years before He created the heavens and earth, meaning, O Muhammad, you are one of the messengers. Now, the thing about the Huruf al Muqatta, these letters that begin the verses of the Quran, all of the verses, uh, all of the letters that begin the chapters of the Quran, all the verse after it, the verse or two after it is a reference to the Qur'an. Alif lam mim thalika al-kitab. For example. Anun wal qalami wa ma yasturun. Except Yasin and Taha. Taha ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an li tashqa. Taha, addressing the problem. We have not revealed the Qur'an for you to become miserable. So because of that, I mean, it's not in, in this book, but this is our commentary, is that this is further credence that Yasin and Taha are two of the names of the Prophet the whole Quran is addressed to the Prophet. I mean, it came down to Yasin and Taha that people are so agitated with. And because they agitate us, we will agitate them until they stop. And they make tawbah. Then Allah Ta'ala continues. It's something that drives you insane. I mean, the things that people focus on is unbelievable. They're preventing us from establishing a relationship with our Prophet And you know me, I like to agitate back. Then Allah Ta'ala continues by the wise Quran. You are truly one of the messengers. Yaseen wal Quran al Hakim. In Naka to the Prophet. In Naka lamin al Mursal. It is confirmed that Yaseen is one of the names of the Prophets. This is Qadi Ayah. That's why I, the first lecture, if anyone remembers that, was, which was so long ago, I spent so much time talking about the author and establishing his credentials so that when it comes to stuff like this, we understand its usage and why it's significant. It is confirmed that Yaseen is one of the names of the Prophet and it is a valid oath. Then, in certain, then it certainly involves respect, and the first oath is further strengthened by being joined to the second oath. Allah, uh, so although it is in the, the vocative case, Allah Ta'ala invokes another oath after it to verify the Prophet's messengership and to attest to the truth of his guidance. Allah Ta'ala swears by the Prophet's name and his book 
that he is one of the messengers bearing his revelation to his slaves, I mean to humanity, and that he is on the straight path by his belief that is a path without any crookedness or deviation from the truth. And Naqash said in his book, Allah Ta'ala did not swear by any of his prophets that they were messengers except for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the case of those who interpret it as meaning, O Master, which are all valid interpretations, by the way, the, uh, one verse can have multiple, uh, indeed has multiple interpretations as we know, the use of Yasin definitely shows Allah's high esteem for him. And indeed, the Prophet himself said, I am the master of the children of Adam, and it is no boast. And I say, Adam, wala fakhr. Sahih hadith. Allah Ta'ala says, no, I swear by this land, and you are a lodger or lawful hill in this land. La uqsimu al balad, wa anta hillun al balad. Mecki said that the correct reading is, I do not swear. Buy it when you are no longer in it after your departure, because the Prophet left Mecca to Medina in the Hijrah. It is also said that the word no is extra. That is, I swear by, by it when you, O Muhammad, are staying in it, or whatever you do not, or whatever you do in it is lawful, according to the two commentaries. They say that the word land here refers to Mecca. And that is, you know, pretty standard of that of the tafsir of that verse. Al Wasati said, Allah Ta'ala means we swear to you by this land which we honored by the fact that you lived there and the, by the blessing of your grave when you are dead in Medina. And so it is the Prophet's presence in these cities that made these cities honored. That's what he's saying. Medina was called what before the Prophet went? Yathrib. It wasn't called Medina. Like on Google Maps, it was Yathrib. Exit 10. Of course, there's no Google Maps back then. I know that's very sad to think. Right? But when the Prophet Sazam came, it's called Al Medina, Al Munawwara, right? the illuminated city. Because the Sahaba said when the Prophet Sazam came into Medina, everything lit up. And when he passed, that light that they observed when he came in disappeared. But there is still light in Medina because of the presence of Rasulullah. Sazam. He'll get into that much, much later in the book. The first interpretation is sounder because the surah is a Meccan one, meaning Surah Al-Balad. What follows confirms this when he says, a lodger in this land. Ibn Atta said something similar to this in his commentary on the words by this secure land. He said, Allah Ta'ala made it safe to be, to be in because the Prophet Sallallahu was there. His existence brings security wherever he is, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His existence, the Prophet's existence brings security wherever he is. And Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Know that the Prophet is with you all the time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then Allah Ta'ala says, by the begetter and what he begot. What is that? وَوَالِدٍ وَمَا وَلَدٍ Some say that Adam is meant and therefore it is a universal statement. Some say that it means Ibrahim and what he begot, thereby indicating the Prophet because he's a descendant of Ismail, in which case the surah swears by Muhammad in two places. Allah Ta'ala says, Alif Lam Mim, that book, no doubt in it, in the beginning of Al-Baqarah, Ibn Abbas said that these letters are oaths by which Allah Ta'ala swears he and other people have said various things about them. As Sahla Tustari said, the Alif is Allah, the Lam is Jibreel, and the Mim is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Asam al Qarandi also said this, but did not attribute it to Sahl. He said that it means that Allah Ta'ala sent down Jibreel to Muhammad Sassan with his book, in which there is no doubt. According to the first interpretation, the important of the oath is that the book is true without doubt, and it involves the direct connection of the two names, a matter whose excellence has previously been stated. How many of those letters are there, by the way, that begin the verses? Does anyone remember? 14, 14 letters from the Arabic alphabet. And if you put those letters together, you can make a sentence. Does anyone remember the sentence? Nasun hakimun qati'un lahu fi sir. Nasun hakimun qati'un fi sir. Every letter of that sentence are those 14 letters. I'll save this for Ramadan. So at least give me one khatira to do in Ramadan. So you guys obviously forget, alhamdulillah. Uh, so a, a wise statement that is absolute in it is a secret. 
And these are called what? Al-Huruf al-Nuraniya, the illuminated lights. And the other 14 letters of the alphabet are called Al-Huruf al-Dhulmaniya, the dark lights that correspond, the first 14 letters correspond to the first half of every lunar month when the moon is getting bigger. And then the other 14 letters correspond to the second half of the lunar month when the moon is getting uh, shrinking in size. And then from the letters that are not the ones in the Quran, there is a dhikr, a special name of Allah Ta'ala that is derived from that called a dhikrul ahamiyya, which I will reveal to you inshallah, Allah gives us life in the month of Ramadan. So stay tuned. Ibn Atta, uh, said that when Allah says, see the Salafis when they teach, they are, no, no one knows what they mean. Alif, lamim, khalas. It's, uh, uh, no one really knows what they mean. Next, right? That's not ilm. This is ilm. Ibn Atta said that when Allah Ta'ala says, qaf, <coughs> by the glorious Quran, qaf for Quran al Majid, he is swearing by the strength, the quwa of the heart of his beloved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, since it was able to bear the impact of his speech and witnessing. You know, Allah says, had the Qur'an been revealed on a mountain, the mountain would crush. The amana uh, was not was rejected by the jibal, the, by the mountains and the earth. But who accepted the amana? We did, out of our ignorance. And then the Qur'an itself, had it been revealed, had it fall, came to the mountain, the mountain would crush. But it came on the heart of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Doing that did not affect him because he was he of his exalted state. You know, Allah Ta'ala prepared the Prophet ﷺ to receive the revelation, which is one of the things about the cutting of the chest that happened, by the way, several times. In one book I read, one of the ulama, he, he narrated, or he found narrations that it had happened seven times in his life. I mean, that might be a little dubious, but definitely at least three times it happened. You know, when he was a child, uh, at the beginning of the revelation, and then at the night of the Isra in the Ma'raj. Uh, it is also said that Qaf is one of the names of the Qur'an. Uh, it is said that it is one of the names of Allah. It is said that it is a mountain. When he says it is said, in Arabic it's Qila. Qila means that this is another opinion that is not as strong as the original opinion that has been presented. And this is the way that the ulama write. So the the first one, when he's swearing by the heart of Muhammad Sallallahu this would be the most authentic or accurate. And then these are other ones that come. They're, they're fine. It doesn't negate, they don't negate one another, but this is the way the ulama write. Uh, Jafar ibn Muhammad said that the verse, by the star when it plunges, when Najmi idha hawa, refers to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. He said the star is the heart of Muhammad Sallallahu when it plunges, means it's, it is expanded by lights. He said he is cut off from other than Allah subha subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was one of the things when the Prophet ﷺ said, ala qalbi, that my heart is clouded. So therefore I do istighfar a hundred times per day. The clouds of the Prophet's hearts are not like our clouds. Our clouds are because we are heedless and forgetful. But the clouds of the Prophet are clouds of light that he is so in the zone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he might be absent minded to his people so he makes istighfar because he's not maybe living up to what he needs to live up to so it has a different meaning and then lastly Ibn Atta said about the words of Allah by the dawn and the ten uh, nights wal fajri wa layalin ash that the dawn is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa because belief dawns from him wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam questions yes of what ah. Someone who's a disbeliever. So, and I on social media, I've heard people say that it's a slur, 
And after hearing what you said that you have to earn the word kafir, like maybe I can see some validity to, validity to that. Well, kufr, disbelief, necessitates that there is an understanding of the truth and then that truth has been rejected. Right. It is true that in our literature, non-Muslims are generally referred to as kuffar. But in the modern age, when we adopt that and bring that to the modern age, that's problematic because it confuses this thing that I'm saying right now. Okay. Because in the pre-modern age, sorry, I keep, your eyes, yeah. your eyes are like hit by the, yeah, the, I can't, sorry. No. <laughs> in the pre-modern age, people were identified mainly by their religion. So people from Europe were not necessarily known as European, but they were known as the Christians. And uh, I mean, in the Western world, and then obviously we're, you know, we're the, the Muhammad and the Saracens, you know, the Muslims. Uh, and then the people out East, well, they're just, yeah, they're just disbelievers. I mean, because religion was common and there was no modern citizenship uh, and no borders and so on and so forth. So that kind of made sense. But technically, what is kufr? Kufr means that somebody has received the message, understood the message, and rejected the message. Because kafara is to cover. So they're covering the truth. So the people at Abu Jahl, he can't, he can't claim that he didn't know. The messenger is right there in front of him. Piecemeal giving him the Quran. So people out there, and Imam al-Ghazali, he does a very good job of explaining this. He has a little book called Faisal al-Tafriqa. Bain al was Zandaq or something like that, which usually referred to as Faisal al Tafriqa. Dr. Sherman Jackson translated it. And he talks about this. He says, uh, yes, there are believers and disbelievers, but there are also people that grow up away from the cities, away from the ulama, and they don't have really any religion. Or there are people who receive misinformation about Islam. So what they're rejecting is that misinformation. Had you been presented with that misinformation, you would reject it too. So are they still considered kafar or no? No, they they're not. And they're not, not only that, but in the in Sunni Islam, we consider those people saved Yom al Qiyamah. Okay. Because Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, wa kunna hatta We do not punish a people unless and until they receive a messenger or a message. So if somebody hasn't received the message, understood the message, then rejected the message, we say that those people are saved Yom al Qiyamah. So then how do we call them kuffar? What is it that they didn't that they disbelieved in? They just had no belief. Okay. So in general, unless you've had like a one-on-one -on -one interaction where someone is like, I reject that, you can't, we can't like assume that anyone is a kuffar. Like that's yeah, you can't assume nor should you assume. Okay. Yeah, because we don't know the state of people's hearts. Okay, just not okay. So, so the question is why he has so many names and the second one why Muhammad is the prevalent name why we use it as a prevalent name when you say Muhammad sallallahu the prophet sallam has many names because in the arabs when something is honored they give it many names when something is important they give it many names this is in the Arabic language, in the philosophy of the Arabic language, things that have multiple names mean that that thing is something that is important or precious, etc. All of the Prophet's names are all sifat, they're all characteristics of him. So he is Muhammad, uh, Ahmed, Hamid, uh, Al Hashir, Mahi, uh, Ra'uf, Rahim, Mudathir, Muzammil, Taha, etc., etc., etc. Some of the ulama compiled them to be over a thousand names. Why do we refer to him as Muhammad? Because that's what's on his birth certificate. On his passport, it says Muhammad ibn Abdullah. That's his name, and that's his formal name. So his name was, and he formally in this world, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Says, you know, the same what you said. These are the characteristics of our Prophet Taha Yasin al Muzammil al Mudassir, Sayyid al Mursaleen, wa Imam al Mutaqeen, wa Khatam al Nabi'een, wa Habibi Rabbil Alameen, 
النبي المصطفى ورسول المجتبى الحكم العدل الحكيم الأليم العزيز الحليم الرؤوف الرحيم نورك القديم والسراتك المستقيم محمد عبدك ورسولك وصفيك وخليلك وحبيبك ووليك ونبيك وأمينك ودليلك ونجيك ونخبتك وخيرتك وزخيرتك وخيرتك إمام الخير وقائد الخير ورسول رحمة النبي الأمي العربي القرشي الحاشمي الأبتحي المكي المدني الالتهامي الشاهد المشهود الولي المقرب العبد المسود الحبيب الشفي الحسيب الرفي المليه البديل صلى الله عليه وسلم so there you go 300, 300 of the 1000 ما شاء الله yeah I believe so. I'd have to verify the exact number. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but he is referred to by other names prevalently throughout the Quran. Uh, yes. And, the and there's a surah called Surah Muhammad. The, and the other question that I had was that uh, you had mentioned the incident that happened early on in his childhood about purifying his heart. And that first incident was when he was at the in the desert with the Bani Saad. But what is his, is there a description of his recollection of what happened to him as a child when that happened? Because there was a witness to that, right? Yes. No, that's his narration. I mean, he 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 stated that that the angels, these two men came that were wearing all white, so they didn't appear in their angelic form, and they took some type of sharp object and split open his chest and they put it in a basin made of gold in water and ice uh, and washed it and then took out this black spot and said, this is the portion of Satan in you and threw it away, returned his heart and sewed his, you know, his chest back up. So it was his narration, not someone's witnessing? Both. I think there are multiple narrations. And then it happens again in his lifetime. The same incident happens again. Yeah, this happened. Yeah, exactly. Some of these modernist Muslims, they'll be like, "Oh, but those are kids, and you can't rely on their memory." All this nonsense. Yeah, that's that's garbage because it happens like three, four other times in the Sira. So how about all those narrations? So you know, these people they sow doubt in in people's minds. Anyway, somebody else. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Um, I, I read this some time ago, but I had, hadn't done uh, much research um, on the passing. It's about Sirat ibn Hisham. I don't know if it was on ibn Hisham or another author about Sirat al-Rasul where the author was discredited and was actually refused to write, uh, to be allowed to write a hadith, but yet the author wrote about Sirat al-Rasul. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to, I'm not really sure if that is something I accurate. think you're talking about Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq, sorry. Yeah. Ibn, Ibn Ishaq is the, yeah. it, but that is lost. We don't have a manuscript of Ibn Ishaq Sira. Oh, we don't. Okay. And the Sira of Ibn Ishaq was part of a larger history project that he was writing. Uh, Ibn Hisham is, is uh, Sira is what is based on Ibn Ishaq, sort of the subject headings and the chronology and stuff like that. But Ibn Hisham, we have this book and this book has been commented on multiple times. And this book is what we rely on. This is considered, even though Ibn Ishaq is before him, this is considered the first book of Sirah or, or the, the mother of all of the Sirah books is the books of Ibn Hisham. But there's no, there's no fewer than like three to 500 Sirah books uh, and commentaries. This is not a book of Sirah. This is something else, but Sira specifically Sira, the history or the chronology of the Prophet, we have several hundred of those books. And a Suhaili's commentary on Ibn Hisham is the most is, is one of the most robust. Very, very rigorously authenticated, and the hadith are, are, are sourced and all of that. Now, of course, in Sira, we have different criteria. I mean, there are some stories that have sound narrations, and there are some stories that don't have sound narrations. And in the Sira, it's not like building Sharia rulings. We accept, we have, we are more lenient in the type of narrations that we accept because we are telling a story. As long as the narration 
uh, doesn't change any principle of Islam or something like that. So in the Sira, uh, uh, you find many, many stories, many, many, you know, even if it's just one little like line or one little narration that might not be that strong, and that's added. And that's why if you if in Arabic, if you want to read that's what you you want to read something that's full that has all of those narrations. Yeah, I mean, this is what I mean. I remember the article was addressing extremism and violent extremism, um, and and how um, extremists essentially base their ideology around the sira, uh, around these these kind of uh, um, you know stories that happened during Prophet Muhammad's time that are just weak uh, with with weak narration. Um, but anyways, thank you for clarifying this. Okay. Yeah. The extremists don't base their th their thoughts on the sira. They base their thoughts on a censored reading they read what they want to read and they hold on to what they want to hold on they only have like 20 30 things that they're focused on and that's the problem it's like swiss cheese it's not a full picture they don't take all of the hadith they don't take all of the quran they repeat the same things over and over again and they go back to like 20 30 points at most that's it that's why it's actually very easy to be able to understand <clears throat> what's wrong with their way of thinking Trying to rehabilitate them is something else because that's a psychology problem because there's something weird going on there. But what they're actually saying, very, very simple. 20, 30 points, that's it. And they only they only hold on to a few hadith and few verses. I wish they would read the seerah. Anybody else? Can I add very quickly then, uh, if no one has a question? Um, well, going back a little bit to the Sira, um, I remember reading on the passing how the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, um, um, uh, uh, not, um, Khadija? Maryam, 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 Maryam okay. was referred not as a wife, but as a jariya at one, one, one of these narrations. Well, she was given to the Prophet Sallallahu by uh, the Muqawqas in Egypt. Right. But there is an opinion in the Sira that she was freed and, and, and it was a wife of the Prophet Sallallahu And the dalil of that is that where she lived in Medina was in a place that, it's not a place where a jari would have lived. And she was treated as Ummahat al-Nabi after the passing of Rasulullah Sallallahu so again, that's why this, those Sira books that have those comments are important. And Maria had a sister. Do you know what her sister's name was? Anybody? In the Ramadan, inshallah. Hmm. <laughs> It says, it would be great to hear more about the letters and the moon. You have to come to ICCP Torah. We are not going to tell you which night we're going to talk about it. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about it after the fundraising on the night of the 27th. Okay, that's good. <laughs> the next question is, you mentioned Ibn Qayyim earlier. Mm. Is it okay to use his information? Ibn Qayyim is, uh, uh, you know, one of the ulama of Islam. He's one of the students of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahumullah. And uh, he's very prolific like Ibn Taymiyyah. And he has many uh, uh, useful uh, books. But his uh, approach to theology is, is troubled. And, and uh, those things should not be taken. Because him and Ibn Taymiyyah, they do not represent Sunni theology, Sunni creed. Uh, Sunni Aqidah. Their Aqidah is, non, is, not, is not Sunni. And as a matter of fact, Ibn Taymiyyah was jailed exactly for this reason. But in the legal realm, Ibn Taymiyyah is a genius. And uh, when I did my work at Princeton on codification, uh, Sharia codification, a lot of legal problems in the codification were solved by the opinions of Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, MashaAllah. So Ibn Taymiyyah was, but Ibn Taymiyyah's problem is he didn't have a teacher. He didn't have a sheikh. He was very intelligent, but he didn't have a sheikh. Like we went and we sat down with our teachers and, you know, year after year, he was just sort of kind of almost self-taught, uh, very, very intelligent, widely read, had a power of retention and was very prolific. Uh, but that kind of gave him, lent him into problems. Ibn, uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Qayyim 
uh, less than Ibn Taymiyyah, but in the issues of Aqidah, uh, problematic. But that being said, he has many beneficial books. I have many of his books in my house, and uh, in my library, and I use them, and, th and there's nothing wrong with that. But one must be aware when it comes to theological matters. That's what I would say. No. The extremists use Ibn Taymiyyah because of these issues of, of Aqidah. Because Ibn Taymiyyah introduced a new twist to the understanding of Tawheed. Ibn Taymiyyah said that Tawheed, there are two kinds of Tawheed. Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah and Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah and Tawheed al-Rububiyyah as concepts exist yani in, the, in the history of Islamic theology, we, we, but not the way Ibn Taymiyyah used them. Ibn Taymiyyah used them to insinuate, and this was the problem, is that he never really directly said it. And there are some narrations that say that he recanted, that he made tawbah from what he said. But Ibn Taymiyyah's opinions are interpreted by people later to mean that we can be uh, followers of one kind of tawheed, but not followers of another kind of tawheed. So therefore we are mushrikun or kuffar. And it is this, exactly this point that they use to do tafsikh of people and takfir. <coughs> Tafsiq of Muslims and takfir of Muslims. They say, oh, you're, you believe in this kind of tawheed, but you don't believe in the other kind of tawheed, so on and so forth. Uh, and, um, oh, I mean, there's so many things, that have, a mountain of things have been written in response to that since the time of Ibn Taymiyyah uh, to the modern time. So this is why they rely on those writings. And because he went to jail and because he died in jail, and he's like the hero. He's like all the street cred, you know? Uh, Imam, uh, uh... A comment and uh, a question. The comment is, uh, you asked us many questions today and you gave us an F, <laughs> but um, Dr. Dean got an A. And I think um, the point there was that when he gave the recital, there was a rhythm in it. And that's a fast dying um, talent amongst our young people. Mm. And I hope that in our Sunday schools, we bring back the rhythm, the poems, the poetry, and the nasheeds in, so that uh, our younger folk who grow up can uh, can benefit from that sort of culture. That's my first point. Okay. The second is in today's um, Juma Kotuba, which was, I must say, fantastic, Thank because you. you referred to the environment, and I've not heard such a uh, stimulating uh, kutuba on the environment. Uh, you referred to the, the tree that wept. Is that an authentic hadith, or is that something that uh, flows from various anecdotes? So in, in regards to the rhythm, uh, uh there are uh, there are two things that i would say number one is that there is a culture uh and a practice of gathering in the mosque to have a session of prayers on the prophet sallam and usually they take place on on fridays or after salat al fajr i remember when i was when i would visit damascus we'd go to the umayyad mosque after uh, sorry right after salat right before salat al fajr and and in Egypt, it's also very common. Some of them are done in silence and some of them are done uh, out loud, but it's an opportunity to, for everyone to gather and to do salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's also some Ottoman traditions of doing salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in between the taraweeh prayers. So we can explore some modification of these type of things to sort of revive uh, the spirit, uh, inshallah. Uh, and there are more things, but let, we'll, we'll start small. Uh, as far as the hadith of the tree weeping, this is in Bukhari. So it's a sound narration. And it's a sound narration for the very simple fact that it happened in public. So all of these different companions, they narrated this hadith. So not only is it a sound narration, but it is the highest form of narration that we have, what we call tawatur. Uh, so it's something that is completely authentic and something that we believe in and it's a very beautiful story. Might, for the benefit of those who are not there, just summarize the tree story. So the story is that the, the Prophet, he used to lean against a tree stump 
when he would give the Friday sermon or when he spoke to the community. And as people increase in Medina, and as the people increased, the, one of the companions suggested, well, let's build a small uh, pulpit for you, member, uh, so we can, you can elevate, so we can see you. So they built a very small one. So the first Juma, the Prophet, he, you know, he ascended the, the pulpit. And then everybody in the mosque heard a sound that was like the sound of a camel giving birth, like this moaning you know, sound, and it was very prominent. So the Prophet, he came down, and then he hugged the tree. And when the Prophet hugged the tree, the sound stopped. And then the Sahaba said, we saw the Prophet speaking to the tree. So they said, what did you say? He said, I, I hugged the tree, so it would, and if I, if I did not hug the tree, it would have been crying until Yom Al-Qiyamah. And I asked the tree, I said, if you want, I will, I will plant you myself in the paradise with me. And the tree spoke, spoke back and said, yes, I prefer that. So the Prophet ordered the tree to be uh, dug up and buried the tree in that spot. The, the Prophet buried the tree. And Imam Hassan al-Basri, radiallahu anhu, he said, uh, when he would narrate this story, he said, how can you hear this story and not weep the way that the tree wept for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this, is the, this was the story. It's in Bukhari and elsewhere. And I mean, it's, it's a very provocative story. It's very deep, but it shows the type of love and mercy that the Prophet Sallallahu had for what most of us would not even think twice about, which is a tree stump. Now take that love and mercy and think about how he was with his people and with his community and his children and his wives, so on and so forth. That's really what we need. That's our target. That's what we need to aspire to. So even though I used it in the khutbah to talk about the environment, it has a very, very, you know, has, has a deeper meaning uh, about that this man just oozed love. You know, he just, he loved people and people saw him and fell in love with him. Uh, من رآه, uh, I think it's من رآه وهلة هابة. Whoever sees him at a moment uh, will see, and, and this is a man, of, they have awe. وَمَنْ عَشِرَهُ أَحَبَّ And whoever lives with him, they fall in love with him. That's how he's described. Imagine being a person that somebody spends some time with you and they all fall in love with you. You know, they have all of these like Dale Carnegie. What is it? How to get people to like you or love you or fall? How to influence people, right? We have that, right? It's the, it's the sunnah of the Prophet He was just He just was straightforward with people and honest. And that's why they loved him. Think about this, Abu Jahl's two sons were married to the two daughters of the Prophet while he was fighting him. I mean, that's just mind-blowing. It's just unbelievable. They all, even Abu Jahl loved him. He freed a slave girl the day he was born because he was so happy. And there's a narration in Bukhari that says that Abu Jahl's uh, punishment is lessened every Monday. He's given like a little bottle of water. Maybe it's not a bottle. Because he freed the slave girl on Monday out of happiness for Rasulullah. So Al-Hafiz al-Damashqi, uh, this famous uh, hadith scholar, what did he say? إِذْ كَانَ هَذَا كَافِرًا جَاءَ ذَمُّهُ بِتَبَّتْ يَدَاهُ فِي النَّارِ مُخَلَّدًا أَتَى أَنَّهُ فِي يَوْمِ الْأُثْنَيْنِ دَائِمًا خُفِّفَ عَنْهُ لِسُرُورِهِ بِأَحْمَدًا he has these three lines of poetry. He says, if this is a kafir, a disbeliever, you know, officially, whose damnation in the hellfire has come from the Quran. It comes to us in a narration that every Monday his punishment is lessened because he expressed happiness for the Prophet how about the one who loves the Prophet all the time and dies as a monotheist? We can go on and on. Alhamdulillah. Anybody else have any other questions? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli afdala salatin ala as'adi makhluqatika Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam adada ma'lumatika wa midada kalimatika kullama 
ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافلون